Hello, my name is Chris Thurston, and you're listening to the first in a series of mini chats we recorded while we were at Rest. In this first one, me and Alex from the podcast talk to Julian Gollop, the creator of XCOM and a bunch of other strategy games, and David Kay, the co-founder of Snapshot Games, about Phoenix Point, which they're working on at the moment, about XCOM, the history of tactics games, and so on. So the sound quality of this is not great. We've we've got a new podcast set up for recording these kind of chats on the go, but Res is the loudest place on earth. And we actually ended up sitting on the floor in the press room to record this. So you will hear at one point a siren and at another point the world's loudest man uh, bedecked in keys walk past jangling and stamping. So I do apologize for the audio levels. We're best to clean it up, but hopefully you still enjoy this as a kind of little short insight into a really interesting uh, creative and game design process. Have fun. Hello and welcome to the show floor at Rest. I'm here with Julian. Hello, uh, I'm Julian, the designer of the original XCOM and many other strategy games since in my long career. And Alex. And I'm Alex, and I'm here with a with a with a actually a, a childhood hero. Oh, <laughs> and a chicken sandwich. And a chicken sandwich. And a chicken sandwich. It's all the best things. And uh, I'm David. I'm a co-founder of Snapshot Games with uh, with Julian. And you are joining us in the quietest, loudest room we could find to record this. We're sitting on the floor, so when anyone walks past, you will hear it. I would like to give you a real sense of what it's like to actually be. On this uh, previous, it used to be a docks docks here, so you still smell the fish, yeah, the roar of the wharfs. I actually had fish and chips for lunch just <laughs> for an additional. That's you then. Right? Uh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so. so Tell us about the, the show so far. Been, you, um, Phoenix Point has been around. So, yeah, we kind of are packs and stuff. Um, how is it going? That's not really a question, so much as a vague prompt to make you start talking. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been going very well. A lot of interest in the game. Uh, we're building up to our first back of release. Um, the demo we got at the show is focusing on a, on a very specific tactical battle. We're trying to show people some of the core systems that we're working on and the tactics and what are the similarities and differences with old XCOM and new XCOM. Um, the community we have is very big and um, is diverse in the sense you have old XCOM people, you have new XCOM people, uh, you have uh, no XCOM people, and um, so the three kinds of people. There's <laughs> <laughs> only three kinds of people in the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, but yeah, the response we're getting from, from all these groups is really good. That's great. Um, so you actually mentioned this, we were talking earlier, and you said that trying to find a way of rebuilding an XCOM style game that catered to those different halves of yes. people who would consider themselves XCOM fans. Yes. That's an interesting problem you've given yourself. Uh, and it's a serious one. I mean, when we launched our uh, crowdfunding campaign, we did a survey of backers and we said what they interested in. And, uh, and there was a divergence of views, shall we say. Um, one thing they wanted was, we want more realistic shooting. Uh, I thought, okay, so does that mean we have to model ballistics and bullets and so on? So that's one of the first things that we tried to to get working and um, but immediately presented very interesting design challenges that we can no longer represent things in this sort of binary way that, you know, um, that's, for example, the new XCOM has a much more of a a, a rules-based system for things and you know this is if I do this then this is going to happen or there's a percentage of chance this is going to happen which is a huge problem um, so we have a more uh, we have a more analog world uh, less digital um, if you like yeah it's more digital <laughs> more simulation-y yeah. and less board gamey, and maybe right. another way to put it yes that's so, so like one of the first thing I noticed was you work with line of sight as opposed yes, to line of sight exactly. between squares um, and we want to make use of this in a game so the actual body parts of a target that are obscuring other body parts is, is a factor in what's happening so he is crabbing has this little big shield he sticks in front of him like this i mean to flank him essentially what you need to do is find some exposed bit of his weaker body parts to try and shoot at you, know, you can go around the side, but you might, if you're a sniper and you've got high level accuracy, you can really actually target smaller parts. His little leg that's sticking out from the side of his shield. Yes, I can cripple him if I get that leg. Don't have to shoot his shield. So these are some of the things that you can do with this system. Um, but the difficulty is trying to represent to the player what is the likely outcome of what he's trying to do. So, in a way, the, the beauty of the 
modern XCOM is that they were able to present to the player um, just by the player looking at the screen, the player could see what he could do in that situation, where he could move, where he could flank. They did have some problems that you couldn't, they didn't have a, like a line of sight sort of tool to say, yes, I will definitely have a line of sight from there, which they fixed a little bit in more of the chosen yeah. when they added the target P system, so they still had some issues with that. Um, but if you go back to a more analog experience, like we have at this point where you can move and shoot and then move a bit more, you, you no longer have this immediate sense of being able to judge what you can do by looking at the screen. However, we do incorporate some of the sort of um, helpful interface elements from UXCOM showing you zone lines. Yes, you can move here and shoot, or you can just move here but not shoot. Um, so we still have help to to the player as far as possible. Um, but yeah, it does it does present. Uh, if anything more of an informational challenge and actually we, we had percentages in the game we had, we had a a uh, little bar information bar very similar to the XCOM shooting thing where uh, it said okay you have like a 65% chance to hit and you're firing the best of six and you do your expected damage is like two to ten um, but this was uh, the actual meaning of this Sort of became lost. Players said, "Does that mean? Does that percentage chance mean to you? if I if I if I do that, do I do this damage, or is this damage based on uh, some of the bullets hitting?" Or I yeah. you've got, we can no longer present that information clearly, so we just got rid of it. Um, so now what we do is we have present to the player if he wants to if he wants to find two if he wants to know more precisely his aiming chance. We've got a little circle which tells you where all the shots come from. And you just have to sort of visually. Yeah, uh, that's what we're testing in the. We also show <clears throat> we also show how much damage you're pretty much guaranteed to do, and then a rate, then then there's a sort of a yeah. Variable. So we have that uh, you have that very sort of high level readout which says well you're almost certainly going to do this damage, but it's possibly going to do that amount of damage. Um, and it goes again. It goes back to a little gripe I had with the new XCOM because they had damage ranges like five to seven. But they always showed the maximum damage in the flashing pits and the health bar, and that was kind of misleading in a way. And how the hell are we going to? How do we show this that you know we've got variable damage, but uh, you know, you're probably going to do this, but you might do this. So these kind of challenges are quite difficult. Do you get that informational precision? Like, does the fact that you have a generally more analog feel to it does that kind of? Relieve you of some of the pressure to be absolutely precise for players because it doesn't you know, win money. Because, yeah. I mean, but because uh, say for example, you've got your guns which are firing bursts of six or twelve, you know, the chances of all of them missing are almost zero. The chances of all of them hitting may also be zero. Um, you tend to get something which you get a more of a bell curve type distribution of your shots, so you're not really caught with that, um, you know. New XCOM dilemma. And you've got, I'm standing next to Zayn, ninety percent chance to hit. I miss. I miss. Um, the weapons they have a. They do kind of end up when you play. When you spend some time, and they do play. You, you get a feel for how the weapons. Yeah, the feeling. Yeah, the feeling is a bit more natural because it's a bit more like, in a way, real world sort of works in a way. So I can see expectations. For, so it's always caught me unawares with the new XCOM actually that being close to the target was far less important than being able to flank the target. Uh, and actually it took me a while to get that <laughs> because that's not the way I expected things to work. Um, but you know, once you got it of course that was an integral part of their gameplay. You know, the XCOM 2 is, a, is, is very much a game about flanking but not getting flanked in your next turn. Um, right. And a good part of the, their tactics revolve around this. To what extent did the game grow up around crab monsters, and what extent did crab monsters grow up, grow up around the game? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we, I, I guess it goes back to our original idea. So, I mean, uh, David was pretty keen was very keen that we do an XCOM style game I said we, we just can't have the alien greys coming along and we can't you know we can't have this um, uh, we can't go back to the usual story I guess I mean so we, we tried to my initial pitch was XCOM with zombies zombie yeah, yeah, XCOM yeah, yeah. so I um, 
so I guess we've got this story which is about a virus that combines human and, and animal based DNA but with something a little bit alien thrown mm -hmm. in there something of the night in there yeah. we'll it. Um, I, I guess so the, the, because part of the story is based on, on the, the idea that this, this mist comes from the sea and everybody is affected by the mist they, they walk into the ocean and this is like where the, the, the alien virus has its breeding grounds for generating so the first aliens that you encounter are a little bit shall we say um, uh, seafood oriented <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's not that doesn't continue like that they start right. to incorporate other things other Life forms. We're not really trying to think how to do it without um, uh, just making it too much like a menagerie. So, actually, the, the way the direction we're going in at the moment is actually starting things starting to look more alien, but having a rough external form of, of uh, some earth creatures. Um, but say so we're, we're evolving that as as we speak. I mean, I, um, obviously, partly being lived, but partly it, it strikes me that. Um, those sort of like multi-part monster designs oh, yes. that perhaps specifically seem ideal for, I don't know whether there's yeah, something, you know, something deterministic, but it does feel like you, you, you know, that unlocked a certain aspect of the game's design. I want you to take yes. down bosses with multiple body parts that can each yes. be removed. You know, this sort of seems like an actual fit there. Why was that an important thing to achieve? What does that bring to the combat sandbox when you suddenly have these multi-part crab monsters that can be taken apart in different orders and offer <laughs> different Yes. Uh, um, well, the main thing, um, in terms of our evolution system, if you like, for the aliens, it allows us to have different body parts with really different functions. So, right. like, we have the queen um, has this sort of abdomen. So, again, it's based on sort of arthropod insect type thing. So, the abdomen is different types of abdomen. Some of them spawn little creatures, so she's giving birth to these little brain sucker type things. Another one. Um, is where it's generating this huge cloud of mist, which makes us a sort of um, semi-intelligent cover for the, the aliens. So different functions, different body parts. Again, that lends itself to the tactics because it, it allows the player to decide, well, if I disable this body part, it will stop the alien doing this. Um, and this can vary a lot depending on the particular combination of body parts the alien's got. You know, um, it might be in this particular mutation that it, the, the vulnerability is really taking out the head because that removes all its willpower so then it just happens to have a lot of abilities that depend on a lot of willpower which is one of the main resources around the game so we are uh, hoping that this will sort of emerge a bit of like emerging gameplay um, through through these very basic mechanisms. Is it intended that those things be sort of immediately readable or is that process kind of like discovering oh this particular form of monster does this through play yeah so uh, the current thinking in terms of the way that the design is going is that we want the player to do to research on the um, the parts of the aliens bodies to figure out there to get the full data on them right yeah. you counter it initially you don't know what it does um, then later on once you once you've got that blueprint and you've got um, uh, you, you may encounter a body part on one alien that appears uh, and one mutation appears later in a different mutation, but you already know what that one does. You may back forward to develop some countermeasures. Um, um, but once you're once you're in the game and you know and you do know what the body parts of the different aliens are doing, you, you will have access to that information. Just the breadth of the you know, because you can disarm. You got a lot, a, a lot more uh, options tactically than you would in yeah. I mean, next form in pure sort of you, you can disarm or you can reduce their ability to you know the, the willpower aspects has that knocked on to the general sort of balance levels in that you need to make a sterner challenge to kind of cater for the fact that players can really adjust the kind of challenge that they're facing uh, we don't know yet is the answer <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, with any game system that relies a lot on combination of different systems interlocking, it, it really requires a lot of testing and implementation to, to get to refine how um, how it works and how the players can respond to it. We will, of course, be extensively testing it with uh, complete noobs <laughs> who uh, may be puzzled about how it how it works. Um, um, but uh, there's an element of exploration in it, so the player can explore different ideas that you might have, depending on 
what a particular alien looks like, you might think, well, that part looks nasty, and might try and do something about that one. Uh, and you can experiment. Uh, brief pause while we enjoy his siren. <laughs> Where is that coming from? It's probably fine. It's probably no. fine. <laughs> Good. Good. Sorry, you were interrupted there. Really. Yeah, I can't remember what I was saying. That's <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned at the start that, that, um, that you're looking at XCOM fans and UFO fans yeah. uh, and people who've played neither. Yes. Um, what are the people who've played neither? Like, what are your kind of gut feelings for what they want and how, how do you bring them in? Um, we are looking at creating an interesting world. That the, the first thing is, are they going to buy into this universe that we're creating? What is interesting about it? You know, what detail does it have? Um, and that is quite important to me. And that's why we've got a really nice writing team. Um, Jonas Karatsu has yeah, worked on yeah. this house, Alan Stroud has worked with us on Case Reborn. Um, and they're really sort of fleshing out how this world works and the whole history of it and the backstory. So we want people to have a world that they can explore and the history of it and it's something that's interesting and appealing and we have a sort of Lovecraftian element to it um, which from my personal point of view also is quite appealing because it's it's um, you know one thing Lovecraft tried to do is he tried to marry the latest science together with this sort of sci-fi horror type approach to uh, you know the complete unknown things that aliens can be um, fear of mixing human and alien and human creature DNA and that kind of stuff is all there um, and uh, so we want to make an attractive world and the second thing we want to do is is really um, uh, play on the character customization stuff which has always been sort of a um, really important part for players in, in both the original game and the new XCOM. The character customization, customization in XCOM 2 is really cool, um, but I want to avoid the... Uh, and it has this RPG feel to it. I mean, I, re I really do think that XCOM, or original XCOM, is kind of like a tactical RPG game, in a way, and if you want to categorize it, mixed with this real strategy layer on top. Um, and... Um, so what I want people to do is, is in, invest in their sources and characters and have a lot of options to customize them in a meaningful way that has an impact on the game. So we'll be able to mix and match different armor parts and armor parts and uh, sort of multi-classing system, which is not so restricted. Um, so allow players to explore a lot more customization options. Because again, it's partly great with XCOM 2 is that you have this sort of tech tree which is very linear and actually your, your soldiers end up being almost the same at the end with a shiny sort of uh, high-tech armor and they were more varied and interesting at the start of the game <laughs> right um, so that's one of the problems we're trying to, to overcome as well so we want this sort of rpg feel of the game also to come through and players really invested in uh, people invested in an interesting world um, and even if they've never played any Oscar game, those things to be attractive to them. Obviously, you're, you're obviously building for that investment now. Was that ever a kind of surprise, the degree to which people in cared about the lives of their XCOM soldiers and the, the, the missing yeah. relationships of those soldiers? Like, uh, yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> a short answer. Uh, yes, it was, it was a surprise. Um, I mean, part of it is, is also the permadeath feature as well, which means that you, you, you constantly have this dilemma between deploying your best guy, who's obviously going to be more effective, but at the same time risking losing him forever yeah. if you put him in a dangerous situation, <laughs> uh, which is kind of really cool um, and adds a lot of tension to the game as well. So, I mean, I mean, you do invest a lot of time and effort in building that late soldiers through the course of the game. It's, it's, that attachment is built through the bitter experience of battle upon battle is not just all character customization at the start of the game. It's, it's kind of, you, you've lived with these characters for many hours and, and uh, nurtured them. And so yeah, I was very surprised. Uh, it wasn't really intended in such a way in the original XCOM. I, 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 um, I, I just don't know. I just felt the right thing to put in 
the game at that point, and uh, that was yeah, I was surprised how how much people invested in it. Because the original Xbox, the the the, uh, the tactics game and the strategy game came together quite very late in the process, didn't it? Yes, so yes. I guess you didn't really have that much experience of playing, you know, entire campaigns. No, I mean, we, we were very hard pressed on the original XCOM because just me and my brother Nick were sort of working on it in terms of programming and design. Uh, we have two artists on the project currently. And we were struggling to, to get all these systems working together. I mean, we had to, the Geoscape and the Tactical Battle were two separate exes. And we had to figure out how to, one had to load the other and we had to transmit the data and we had to uh, figure out how to get all of the um, you know, procedural levels built and manage that. And it was, it was late in the day before, we, before it came together as a coherent game and we were very worried about it and we were right up to the end we thought you know, this is just not going to work this is not going to work but the QA team at Microprose were very supportive they, they, they really saw something in it and we thought well uh, we'll just you know we'll keep plugging away until we get it done um, and Microprose were giving us a real hard day on this as well so it's quite difficult what was the appeal of returning to XCOM? Or like, sorry, to the um, tactical format. To, to this, the XCOM style game, yes. the XCOM genre. Yeah, yeah. Sort of Whatever, yeah. Um, the appeal is, uh, I guess it goes back to what I was trying to do originally. I, I really wanted to create games that I really like to play and get invested in. I, I, I love the combination of high level strategy and tactics. Some of my favourite board games are like this. Um, not as many of those. And um, coming back to it in a way is because, largely thanks to the new Veraxis X Commons, they've popularised uh, what was a very old game and made something modern out of it. And they've proved that this style of game can be popular and has a big audience. And, you know, we thought when we went into a crowdfunding campaign, we thought we were, we were going to set a high goal for our campaign, which was five hundred thousand dollars at the time. Um, and if if this is true, that people really do want more of this style of game, then we will succeed. It's been fascinating. If this is not true, yeah. then <laughs> we would fail and we'd do something else. But they, <laughs> yeah. It's been really fascinating watching um, tactics games kind of explode recently in general, like. We're still talking about Into the Breach, and I mean, even Overland, e Overland, yeah. and, uh, so sort of it's a little tactics game. Um, the, the big ones like like um, Phoenix Point and, and the next con. Um, I remember I spoke to you a long time, quite a few years ago, when tactics games just didn't seem to be being snapped up. They weren't being financed, and they weren't parity people. No, not at all. What do you put the current Masons down to? Uh, well, partly it's because game players are in fact a much more diverse group of people, probably um, a much larger audience. Um, and, you know, a number of companies have managed to sort of um, stake a little, you know, part of this huge audience um, very successfully. Paradox was one example. Um, or even Sega, for example. You could say, well, Sega are now a specialised strategy game yeah. <laughs> publisher. I never thought that. I mean, if, I, if I'd said to you, you know, like, like 20 years ago, Sega would just specialise in strategy games. They would forget about consoles. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you would thought it was crazy, but you know, that's the way it's happened. And, um, I think in general, just looking at where the industry is now, it's a lot easier for a lot more genres were going underserved five, ten year, years ago than, than now because there used to be this relatively small you know, number of ways you could get to market, number of ways you could get money. So, and you know, publishers are famously, uh, understandably, risk averse. So, you know, it's sort of a, a genre that was underserved. It's easier to kind of take a, you know, take, take a risk on. Yeah, and it's, they're on consoles as well. I was just looking at the, the Nintendo's got a Switch kind of thing just outside here, and 
they're showing uh, bad north. Like that's just like a, you know console tactics yeah. game. Apparently, you know it's on PC as well. I think. Yeah, I mean, although I suppose you could argue that there's always been like a dual heritage of like tactics games in terms of the yes. Wars. That's true. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I was a big fan of um, you know tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics, Advance Wars, Fire Emblem. At this point, I thought, well, you know, the only turn-based sort of tactical style games are on these consoles yeah. and, it was, um, um, and I've actually done a couple of tactics games for consoles yeah. as well. It's it, it, Laser Quest and uh, Ghost Recon. Um, Ghost Recon Shadow Wars and oh, the previous one was called Rebel Star Tactical Rebel Star. Command. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to uh, make it obvious. Um, so yeah, when Advanced Wars came out I was absolutely overjoyed. I thought, ah, this proves that I am right. There is still because it was all RTS games, don't forget. I mean, RTS games killed off any turn-based sort of style game, and that was that was a big issue. And there was this like huge flood of RTS games. And now RTS games are, you know, a tiny genre. It's kind of uh, it's kind of switched around a bit. Do you think maybe interesting? Do you think maybe mobile as a platform has helped a little bit with that? Like turn-based is a very good fit for like short session. Yes, kind of. Absolutely. Um, like quite accessible in terms of interactive, in terms of how many controls you need and how something's controlled. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're actually some of the most popular and um, successful games on mobile are, are really quite you know, uh, detailed strategy games. Yeah. Uh, some of them are turn based on, you know, Clash of Clans or whatever, or Hero Academy, it's a nice really nice turn based game, and stuff like that is. Um, uh, of course, it's been Final Fantasy. Uh, sorry, Fire Emblem. Yeah, mobile has been. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite a lot. And um, again, it, it just goes to show. I mean, it, people used to say turn-based games are dead because uh, everything is real time. But it's, I think people really like just the direct involvement and feedback you get from a turn-based game. I'm going to move this here, and it's going to do something's going to happen. Well, it's also it's a game. I mean, turn turn-based strategy. I mean, chess is a turn-based strategy game. Yeah. So the you know, strategy games, by definition, you don't need to master a particular set of controls. You just basically need to be able to make mm. decisions, and that's like that's the fundamental, fundamentally, like what games. Oh. Yeah. 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 And also, maybe this, this also accompanies a huge tabletop renaissance yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So board games and, and tabletop games, miniature games are all hugely on the rise again. It's very interesting. There's a desire for more like detailed analog and um, like uh, shared experiences and things like that. Yes. I wonder if that has an interesting relationship with the way people share stories now from XCOM, presumably the Will from Phoenix Point and other games. It's like uh, FPL has a similar thing, right? Your ability to name your crew. Yeah. But then again, feel like that kind of tactical we were talking about created this whole almost like genre of telling story, not game storytelling in terms of narrative in the game, but the stories they told about the game, the, the yes. street threads of people's XCOM campaigns. Is that something you would then chase as a designer? Like, how do we get people to do more of that? Ah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, going back to board games, I mean, my first level was board games. I was making board games before home computers even existed. Um, uh, and again, one interesting thing about board games is is, is that um, if you like, there's a, there's a meta game which is about the interaction of the people involved in the game, and the game itself is needing for that interaction. Um, it does mean that you can have you can play board games against people who are just very nice and you know, some bad experiences and so on, but. Um, I the other thing that has, has happened with with board games is it's there's been innovation in pure game design as opposed to just technology. So uh, which is really interesting to see. Um, so game design is not technology driven as such, and it can be facilitated by new tech. You know, new technologies can really unlock new possibilities. Um, but even with a fixed technology like board games, <laughs> um, you can have some really interesting innovation. There's been a surprising amount of innovation in board games. Um, and uh, that has personally surprised me a lot. Um, has also proved to me that you, know, you can innovate without having to um, follow any particular pattern that's done exactly before. And, um, and that kind of that kind of innovation in board games is constantly surprising. I don't know how. I mean, has come back and influenced computer games a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can imagine quite a lot of people are going to board games having 
been excited yep. by by kind of turn based kind of games yeah. on, on exactly. the computers now. Like, um, yeah. Great. I think we might wrap up there. It's really the time. So thank you so much for your time. Perfectly. Uh, well, thank you. Really good. I was waffle yeah. too yeah. much. No, no, not at all. No, I, no, you're talking to me and Alex. Like, <laughs> I don't want to apologise here. It's still us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, great. Yeah, well, all best. Uh, Thanks very much. Thank you. So thanks for listening and join us tomorrow for the next in this series of chats when I will be talking to uh, Robert Kurvitz who's the writer of Disco Elysium, which was my standout game of, of Rezd this year. Uh, really interesting chat about that game and the philosophy of his writing and his, uh, I think, rather unique journey to becoming a games developer. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, this series is kind of an experiment that I want to do to see if people enjoy it. So let us know either on Twitter or on the Discord, at Great and Crowbar, if you would like us to do more of this kind of thing, because I think it's a really interesting use of the podcast really uh yeah as ever create and crowbar is supported by our patreon at create and forward slash patreon that's entirely incorrect it's patreon.com forward slash create and crowbar i'm not going to re-record that i don't need to whatever uh yeah that's it anyway thanks bye